Welcome to the Burnt Out to Lit Up podcast. I'm your host, Erica Del Pozo, occupational therapist, Miami girl, and founder and CEO of Joy Energy Times, where it's our mission to build a better healthcare industry by ending healthcare provider burnout. In these episodes, we'll discuss topics like stress management, personal and occupational well-being, energy, lifestyle, and more. You'll also hear from loads of healthcare professionals like you who provide us with their advice on burnout prevention and share ways that you can become your most lit up self. Ready to get started? Let's do this. What up and welcome to the Burnt Out to Lit Up podcast. It's me, Erica, and today we're going to hang out with Claire Brady. She is such a cool person. I'm so glad I connected with her. Just like many of my guests, I found her on Instagram. And that's the beautiful thing about Instagram is that you can find your niche and your community. So on my Instagram, joy.energy.time, I connect with healthcare professionals and I'm really inspired by that community. Every day I'm finding new people, new people are finding me, and we're just growing. This community is amazing. There's so many different types of niches on Instagram and the healthcare community is definitely a big one. So I'm in there. If you're not following me, follow me, send me a DM. Let me know that you heard, you found out about the page or you found out about me through the podcast. What I'm starting to notice now after six months of podcasting is that I'm noticing people are sharing this more on their Insta stories, um, yeah, that's where I'm really seeing it. People are sharing the episode, what any episode, um, they're sharing the show on Insta story, and I couldn't be more grateful. That's really how you find out about your favorite things and products and shows and all this stuff is when your friends, you know, you hear about it through your friends' pages and they're recommending something. So. It means a lot to me that people are are starting to to share this, that I'm being heard, that my voice isn't just going into outer space and no one's listening to me. Like this is a real thing and people really tune in. So I'm grateful. The more you share it, the better. Spread the love, honey. (laughs) And I I just appreciate it. It just makes me feel validated that, okay, this show, I mean, for for now, it's free. It's a free labor of love. Like, I don't have any ads. I don't have anything. So it's like putting the time and effort and research into this show. It means a lot when someone's listening and and lets me know, you know, either DM or Insta story or whatever. So if you're listening, just show me a little bit of love. Un poquito de amor, por favor. (laughs) And I really appreciate it. But yeah, so I'm going to uh, bring in the interview in a second, but I just want to give you a little introduction. Claire is a third year medical student. She's into integrative medicine and health, which I love. And we talk about that on the show. She is a yoga teacher. Uh, she's based in St. Louis, Missouri, and she is an eating disorder survivor like I am. So we get emotional we, she shares her history with her eating disorder, and I could not relate to it anymore. Like, I couldn't even believe it. it. was like she and I, even though we're two different people, had two different experiences. There were so many similarities. Um, and we go into recovery, and now she's an eating disorder advocate. So Claire's just all around amazing. Her Instagram is fitting it all in, and that's also her blog, so you can find her there. What touched me is that she shares that girls have reached out to her that have uh, eating disorders and have recovered from them, and she's just a light. So without further ado, let's bring on Claire Brady. If you could just tell us um, what's your story, like where you're from and what's your journey been like and how you got into where you are today. Okay, sure. So um, my name is Claire. I currently live in St. Louis, Missouri, and I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. Um, I, you know, grew up, went to high school here, all of that. I went to the University of Notre Dame for college where I majored in marketing and graphic design. Um, And... 
after college, I took a job here in St. Louis at Brown Shoe Company. It was sort of a business management track job. Um, and that job transferred me down to Dallas. Um, and when I was in Dallas, I started working at a small ad agency instead. Um, and then while I was working at that ad agency, I was about 24, 25 at that point. Uh, I decided to completely change careers and pursue medical school. And that was the culmination of lots of different things and lots of long, hard months of decision making. Um, probably all started with eating disorder recovery and learning a lot more about my body um, and human physiology. I also, while I was working, um, enrolled at the Institute for Integrative Nutrition and learned more about that aspect of health um, and was just feeling like path for me and the way for me to be most fulfilled in my career was in some sort of healthcare model um, and not in marketing. <laughs> yeah. So um, I enrolled in a post back program at the University of Virginia because I had not taken a science class <laughs> since I was in high school <laughs> um, and did sort of a crash course year of all of the prerequisites um, and then took a year to apply to med school and I am currently a fourth year so I have one year left of medical school. Um, and we'll be applying to residency this summer. Um, so that's exciting. And then I also have a blog um, and a couple other things so people can follow along with me. That's so cool. So what was that process like of having not having taken a science class since high school and then totally jumping into that world? Yeah, I was pretty nervous having been out of school for a while. Um, but it really was great. So all of my classmates, there were 30 of us, we were all in the same post back program for career changers. So none of us had taken science classes. <laughs> um, the faculty obviously knew that that's what it was designed for. Right. Um, and, and the cool thing is that we were all super motivated, like we all very intentionally chose to go back to school to become physicians. And so it was like, truly some of the like the brightest, smartest, most incredible people I've ever met. And we were so collaborative and helped each other so much. So it really was not as hard as I thought. I, I really like school, obviously. I'm choosing to like be in school and learn forever. Um, but it really um, was a lot better of an experience than I thought it might be. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, like you always hear, well, I always hear like the, the hardships of getting into med school and that's, you know, people mainly coming from undergrad. So I'm sure you just had like a totally different experience of, um, you know, going through med school with all these other people that had a lot of similarities with you. Yeah, I think it was actually better for me. Um, I, you know, a lot of my good friends in college were pre-med and the pre-med major at Notre Dame is like notoriously incredibly difficult. And I have like vivid memories of them stressing out incre like incredibly over their different organic chemistry tests and stuff. So I was pretty nervous. But I think because I didn't go the traditional route, I was kind of naive to like how hard and how challenging it was to get into med school and to make it work. So I kind of just like floated along in this state of naive bliss. <laughs> uh, and luckily, you know, it worked out for me and I did well in my classes and I did OK on the MCAT. But looking back, I'm like, oh, man, a lot of people had it a lot worse than me. <laughs> I'm really lucky. <laughs> yeah, it's like that perspective of you know, appreciating the journey and appreciating how things flowed for you, it seemed like. Yeah, you know, it's not the normal timeline, but it worked out well for me. I've always said I, I don't know that I would have been ready for med school right out of college. I was still sort of in a little bit of a recovery period from my eating disorder. Um, and I, you know, med school is super challenging and stressful, and I don't know that I would have been um, ready to do it at that point. So I think that my timing worked out just as it's supposed to. Yeah, yeah, I believe everything happens for a reason. And sometimes we feel we can feel so stuck, like some doors aren't opening. But then when you look back, it's like, wow, that was meant that was a part of my journey, even though I didn't see it at the time. Oh, absolutely. And you know, I, I think that you know, going to integrative nutrition got me interested in the nutrition side of things and having my blog opened up this whole other side of connecting with people. And I think that will play into my future medical practice. And I don't know that I would have had any of that had I decided to go straight to med school. So yes, it all definitely will happen for a reason and work out. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I, you know, remind myself, take a deep breath, <laughs> take one step at a time. And 
everything works itself out. Like everything's always going to be fine. Because when you look back, sometimes you always you always figure it out, even though like we don't give ourselves enough credit for it, but we always figure it out. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, so, yeah. So I want to ask you, you know, like you, you talked about, you mentioned your um, eating disorder and um, I actually in, had an eating disorder too. Um, and it's just like, it's, there's a, there's, you know, it, it doesn't manifest the same way in everyone. And mm-hmm. um, when I was a dance major, I, it, it kind of just developed and took over my life and um, I talked about it a little bit in the first podcast, but I don't, it's just like, it was over 10 years ago for me. And it's like, looking back, it was just like a totally different time. I mean, um, do you mind, or would you be willing to share some of your stories with your eating disorder and how you were able to overcome that? Yeah, absolutely. And I feel the same way as you, my eating disorder was now like over 10 years ago and it feels like a totally different person. Yeah. Uh, Sometimes I forget that like it ever happened. And yet in other ways, it's a very huge part of who I am. Um, so my eating disorder, which was anorexia, it was a restrictive eating disorder started when I was, um, a junior in high school. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, at the time I had no idea what it was or what was going on. Um, eating disorders weren't really talked about the same way. This would have been like 2004. Mm-hmm. Um, but looking back, I, um, you know, I definitely fit sort of the typical mold, which is sort of a high performing type A perfectionist person, like, you know, young girl. Um, and I had just sort of gone through my first real breakup. And for me, I think it was a total loss of control. Um, issue and the eating became something I could control and um, you know you start getting compliments and then you take the perfectionist attitude and soon you are like totally overwhelmed by this eating disorder Um, so I you know finally went to the doctor with my mom and um, started seeing a nutritionist and a therapist and because I'm a perfectionist I adhered perfectly to the eating plan but (laughs) um, (laughs) It was all sort of an anxiety thing for me, a perfectionist thing, because even though I was adhering to the meal plan, that's sort of like not the point. Like I wasn't loose and natural with my eating. I was so rigid and perfect um, and wouldn't stray from it at all. So um, I went to college and all freshman year, I continued seeing a therapist and I was eating a fair amount, I felt like, but it was all really healthy food and, you know, just wasn't gaining the right weight and um Finally, during my sophomore year of college, I started an SSRI for anxiety, um, which is a medication um, for anxiety. And I also sort of started hanging out with a new group of friends that I felt like sort of understood me and supported me better. And things sort of totally turned around. I became much more loose and had fun and went to tailgates. And uh, it was a total blast. I sometimes refer to it as like eating disorder recovery via tailgate. (laughs) We would just like eat burgers and brownies and like drink beer at tailgates all the time. Um, and I, I ended up the next couple of years, even though I wasn't like acutely anorexic, I was still struggling with learning how to um, eat normally. And it sort of swayed to the opposite end where I was eating too much and didn't understand my hunger cues for a while. And then I went on another, you know, health kick where I was quote healthy, but was probably a little too rigid again. And um, it finally got to the point in my sort of earlier 20s that I realized I needed to just like totally give up control and, and work on intuitive eating. And that was when I wasn't getting my period. And I realized like, OK, I'm still not at the at the right point yet. Um, probably a little too into to exercise and running for my own good. So um, worked just sort of on totally giving up control and intuitive eating and allowing my body to be whatever size it wanted to be, regardless of what that was and regardless of whether or not that met the ideal body that I wanted. Um, and just sort of have never looked back. And it's amazing. Like when I think back that I used to weigh myself multiple times a day and count calories and think about every next meal, it seems like totally undoable <laughs> right now because I'm just so much more flexible and I sort of eat whatever I want and try to stay balanced and I try to get good exercise but don't freak out if I can't and um, my body just sort of knows how to handle itself and I don't weigh myself but I've been wearing the same clothes for quite a few years now so um, it's it's a much better state 
of being. And I, I love working with girls and encouraging them to get there because uh, it's so much more freeing and happy. Yeah. Wow. I just like teared up because um, every like most of what you said Except for the, t- well, I'll get to the toge part later. But um, I mean, I could relate to that one thousand mm-hmm. percent. And um, I mean, like to a T. It's like it's like you. It's like I went through that the 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 um, perfectionism, the mm-hmm. being in control, and then like weighing yourself multiple times a day. It's like you're imprisoned mentally, oh, totally. and it's this it's all it's like the the remedy for that i believe not for everyone and but for you and me the remedy was um or a part of it was like that social interaction absolutely yeah i i did find like what you said that you found a group of friends that were supportive that's what happened with me and i realized that i was in living in my own head and they were help they helped me to like be in reality and enjoy like normal food and, you know and like be happy with my body and I was like this concept is so foreign I haven't been happy with myself for so long and then like when I got to grad school um as my eating disorder was throughout college and when I got to grad school I I basically had no college experience um mm-hmm. and then in grad school like I made up for that with <laughs> I, I met my my husband that like in in grad school and um like they showed me like how to be social and I, I became like a totally new person and mm-hmm. it's like what you experience I, I just that it's just it's like medicine like that social like people that care about you and oh and, absolutely it's yeah. like it's like I realized what I was missing you know like yeah through the end of high school and my first year of college I was not me I wasn't making real friendships I wasn't being spontaneous the way you're supposed to when you're young and and I had this like whole new sense of like, oh my goodness, it's so good the other way. How could I be missing this? Um, and the other thing I wanted to note when you say you're like trapped in your body, I, some people have really bad body dysmorphia and I definitely think I had a little bit cause I don't know that I fully understood how thin I was, but I didn't like the way I looked. Like I was like, wow, I'm too skinny. And it is such a disorder and such a, a brain disease that I could not make changes like I knew what I needed to do and I couldn't Mm -hmm. and that's what I think some people don't understand when they think eating disorders are a choice um yeah so anyway it's yes it's a real challenging (laughs) thing and much better on the other side if you are lucky enough to recover yeah yeah I can attest to going to a nutritionist and following that plan to T, but it wasn't it was kind of like the exterior but I needed to fix the interior <laughs> and Absolutely. yeah so like how how what is your role now as an advocate because I know you you mentioned that yeah so um, before medical school I was pretty involved with the National Eating Disorders Association um, which is a phenomenal organization I um, I participated in some lobbying and some of their like walks that they have here in Missouri. I signed up as a NIDA navigator, which is someone that is a non-professional that just volunteers to be sort of a, a resource and a communication point with people that are struggling. So they could match me with someone that reached out and said they were struggling. And I was, like I said, I couldn't provide any medical advice, but I was just there to be a support and an understanding ear. That was something I had to stop when I started medical school because you can't be in any professional role. And I didn't want to like toe that line. Um, And then I also, when I was in my post back, I was a need a walk planner. So I ran the entire um, National Eating Disorders Association charity walk in um, Charlottesville, Virginia, and I've been to a couple of their conferences as well. So they're just sort of the the big major eating disorders association that provides um, advocacy and education resources. Um, And then through my blog, I like to, you know, I have girls reach out to me all the time because I've been very open about my eating disorder and my recovery. And I just, you know, try to give them good advice, which is often like, you need to go see a team of professionals. Right. Um, but I know how much it helps just to have someone that gets it because I didn't have that when I was going through it. And so many other people just say the wrong thing and don't yes. get it. And so having someone that can just say what you're feeling is normal, I totally understand. I've been there can help so much. Yeah, I yeah, like definitely I being transparent, like you being transparent has allowed so many girls to reach out and at least feel 
that they're heard and that they can see you know the the next step and that's so important because like you and I like I didn't have that you're right people people say the wrong things and I think sometimes people want to help you but they don't know how and it comes off as mean or you know like, like you need to eat but it's it's actually like the you just eat some cake like, right yeah. yeah yeah they're tricky they're um they're really complicated diseases now that I'm on the medical side um and have learned how you handle them like it's definitely interesting to see them from the opposite side Um, yes absolutely and um since i'm an occupational therapist i um i know ot's have a role in mental health and and, and in these different places but i haven't had the opportunity to work in that type of role um but we i was an adjunct professor for uh three semesters and in this last semester we did some role playing with the motivational interviewing Mm -hmm. and so we role play like I was role playing with a student and I acted like I had an eating disorder I was an inpatient and like it's that dialogue the motivational interviewing like I know it's it's evidence-based a lot of it's like this new wave of um providing like patient education and it's like when you feel like you're heard like if someone's mm-hmm. listening to you it's much more effective than when someone's just telling you to eat because that just backfires or if any in, in in any case you know right yeah absolutely that's a huge part of it is just feeling heard and understood and yes that can play a huge role in all different health conditions <laughs> yeah yeah um and I, so I know you mentioned intuitive eating and, um, I feel the same way. I haven't weighed myself in, um, I don't know how long and maybe once in a while when I remember if I'm at Publix or a grocery store in Florida, mm-hmm. um, it's like intuitive eating. I, it's so freeing. Like, so what, if you're talking to someone, um, if you're giving advice to, to someone, if they're interested in intuitive eating, like what would be your personal advice to them? To get started with intuitive eating. Yeah. Um, So I guess I'll give a plug to the program I did, which is Jamie Mendel's intuitive eating program. Mm -hmm. Um, I sort of did it in her very infant stages. um, And now she has a huge business of doing it. It's a 21 day email program uh, that sends you these different emails with projects and, and assignments to do each day and just helps you get in tune with your body and sort of change your perceptions around food. And it made me actually just like think and listen to my body a lot more. And I realized how many like random food rules I had created for myself that were silly. Yes. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. And so I just sort of, yeah, that, that program was sort of my initial foray into it. Um, And a lot of it was just literally trust and letting go. Like, you have to just realize that what you're doing right now is making you miserable and trapped and you can't live a normal fun life because you're constantly worried about food and eating the right thing. And I got so sick of it that I was like, I have to try something else. So I'm just going to go with eating whatever my body wants to eat and whatever my body does, we'll figure it out, you know? And so I initially gained a little more weight and then I just kept going with it and my body, once it started trusting me again, you know, that I was going to feed it and not, you know, have to binge on sweet foods because they were off limits and stuff. I just settled into sort of my normal baseline healthy weight. You know, it's not, it's right around probably average for my height. It's not like super thin. It's not, it's just where my body likes to be. And I feel like I can have periods where I don't eat very healthfully um, and I'm eating a lot of sweets and, you know, and, you know, indulgent foods. And then I'll go back to a period where my body's craving salads and I just sort of stay the same. Like I said, I don't weigh myself, but really it's only like at the doctor once a year now. And I feel like I'm always within like the same couple of pounds regardless. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. so you just sort of learn like, hey, your body wants to stay at its steady point. Like it's pretty smart. It knows how to keep you there so long as you let it. Yeah, I think a lot of people uh, growing up in, you know, the 90s with all these diet fads. And I think it's ruined so many people's like mentality about around food and the relationship with food. And I've seen people around me do all or nothing sort of diets. And it's like this trap. And it once and I totally 
I agree with you. Like, I go through seasons where I indulge a little bit or where I'm like, right now I'm drinking kombucha because it's like my, like my favorite thing now. And it's um, like listening to your body. Like, now I realized the key was like, not that I can't eat this, but I get to eat this. Like, that type yeah. of mentality. Yeah. And like, I know for me, I will always lean towards eating more and eating more indulgent versus not, like, versus the restricting side because I'm like so terrified I guess internally sort of subconsciously of getting back to a disordered eating place that I probably would more often overeat than undereat now but like still it's totally fine and I recognize that given my history that's sort of where I need to be um, and just earlier tonight I was watching a video on self-compassion and that's a huge part of it I think people get scared that if they let themselves eat whatever they want they're just gonna eat crap and that's not what self-compassion and intuitive eating is about. It's about realizing what taking care of yourself truly means. And and they likened it to a mom taking care of their kid. When a mom is, cares about their kid, they don't say like, hey, go eat chocolate and drink soda for four meals a day because that's what's fun and that's what you like. They say like, we should probably eat healthy foods and get good sleep and do all these things that make us feel good, but we're still going to have treats and it's fun. And like that's what self-compassion is it's recognizing what your body really wants to feel good but not restricting it from enjoying things as well yeah so i'm i'm gonna put the link to that program you mentioned in the show notes for anyone that's okay. interested um sounds great and i think a lot of people need to just rewind and like go back to like that fundamental like basics and stuff trying i feel like people get fancy now with like all these new keto Ooh. like keto diets and paleo and there's something wrong with that but I think you have to get your mind first like your mindset first there's so many different ways of eating and like right. nutrition research is fascinating but like tons of different diets have good research that show good outcomes and sometimes I'm like I wonder what would happen if we just didn't have any food advertising and no diet advertising like what would you just eat naturally if you listen to your body oh and, yeah right like yeah. I think he would be like, hmm, zero carbs ever. You know, that doesn't seem natural. So Yeah, that's just a, <laughs> a personal pet peeve of mine when people tell me they're trying to cut carbs out. I'm like, you know, your body needs carbs. To <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of people don't even realize that, like, the majority of, like, fruits and vegetables they eat are just, like, broken down into carbs. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I I hear like people um I have done it. I've done it too where we think we're scientists because we read one Facebook article on carbs or something. So. Oh, right. And like I am not an expert by any means on it, but I definitely have learned that you have to take stuff that you read in the media like in a, with a grain of salt and like I always try like, you know, they everyone's going to post a catchy flashy headline, but sometimes I'm like you should probably just click through to the link to the actual study <laughs> and read what it actually says. Yeah, like I've seen people post, you know, a, a glass of red wine is equivalent to an hour in the gym. I'm like, oh, okay, I don't know what study that is. That would be great, but... Whatever floats your boat, I dig it. Right. If you just want to, like, pretend you're reading science, you know. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like, I, I think science is fascinating, obviously, but sometimes, and especially if you come from a sort of disordered eating mindset, it can, uh, it can take you to the not-so-good place. So you have to know yourself really well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, this totally brings us to my next question about wellness. And you're um, <clears throat> you're an advocate for eating disorders, but you're also studying integrative health, and you've had your experience with intuitive eating. And I know wellness is so hot. There's like wellness and self care is like super in. So like, what mm -hmm. like what is your definition of wellness? And like. Okay, I guess we'll just start there. What, what, yeah, what is your definition of wellness? Oh boy, um, I've never like been asked to completely define that before. But I, <laughs> I think of wellness. I think of a version of health that is like mind, body, spirit, not just fitness, not just nutrition, um, but also takes into account your um, relationships, your mental health, your job satisfaction, like. I think that health is a broader topic like and so for me wellness is like taking care of all of those aspects of you um yeah i guess that's kind of it for me that's yeah <laughs> no i just thought yeah for your own personal like everyone's personal definition of wellness um differs and i'm really interested in hearing 
uh, what what people how they define wellness because um I see it you know on the market and it can I feel like people can get kind of lost in it and like it's, it's a buzzword right now right like yeah matcha is wellness and all you know there's lots of different things like you know people are making money on fancy different supplements and stuff because it's wellness and this is what you need but I think it can be it's a lot more I mean obviously some of that stuff is great and I think that um just the act of maybe purchasing something or doing something for yourself that seems a little um special is a form of self-care and wellness and that's mm -hmm. fine if that works for you but like it's not necessary sometimes all it takes is like closing the door and giving yourself an hour alone like it's so dependent on the person yeah yeah exactly I've been reading about that lately and for I mean for me wellness is it is that is taking time to recover because I'm kind of like an omnivore I'm not quite I think I'm more on the introverted side than extrovert, so I feel like recharging, like away from people, is my definition of, of wellness. You know? Oh yeah, I'm an extroverted introvert. Like, I'm a talkative <laughs> people person. Like I'm usually the one in the room that won't shut up. But I've always, since I was little, had to have alone time. Right. Um, right. So. I, I yeah, just, uh, extroverted introvert. I I think um. <laughs> I heard the term omnivore, and I think that's what that I've is. Heard that that makes sense, though. I think a lot more people are identifying with that now. But I've also heard that, like, what the definition of those really is is where you get your energy, like where you recharge. And I definitely recharge with like alone time. But I don't know. I don't. I don't think anyone would ever tell me I'm an introvert. I talk too much for that. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's funny. I like. I used to be so shy, but then. I'm a, I don't know. I don't know what I am, but um, I started a podcast. <laughs> yeah. Do introverts start podcasts? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I'm not as introverted as I used to be then. Um, yeah, but you can talk to people, but like from your own bed. So maybe that's why <laughs> you yeah. don't actually have to go anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually last night, a lot of um, the Instagrammers in the medical community, the ones in South Florida, we had a meetup and, and that was cool because, oh, cool. yeah, and I, um, you know, it'd be cool if like, because, you know, we follow, like, the same people. It'd be all oh, – it'd be so oh. cool we could, like, all get together. Oh, I know. Have, like, some huge online meetup type thing, a conference <laughs> or something. I know. Well, that's what we used to do, like, the Healthy Living Blogger world back when I started blogging eight years ago. We used to have conferences. It was called the Healthy Living Conference. We went to Boston, went to Philadelphia, and we all just, like, hung out for a weekend. That's so nice. Yeah. That's, like, how I met all, like, the original bloggers and became friends with them. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. Back like. Back in the day? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, um, this is a little, um, a, like, reveal. I don't know what the word, I can't think of the word, um, but, like, a surprise that I'm announcing on air, but I... Oh! Oh, yeah, it's a big... Well, no, nothing has happened yet, but I plan to have, like, a summit for uh, healthcare professionals uh, sometime oh. next year, so, yeah. Oh, that's so cool! Yeah. That's great. I like love a, it. Like a wellness um, burnout prevention summit for for all healthcare professionals. So that's like that's, heck yes. I'll help you plan it. That Ooh. sounds amazing. I yeah. know some people that might want to get in on that. Oh man, that'd be awesome. Like I, it's like one of those. I have like pretty lofty goals being an entrepreneur and yeah. <laughs> and like I don't even tell. Like I've never the only other person that knows that's my husband because I'm like um. I've never planned an event, but I want to have a summit, an annual summit, okay? <laughs> Dream big, you know, and they yeah. say the best way to achieve your goals to, is to state them publicly, right? Oh, well, yeah. Well, that was well, like research on that, I think. There's research on that? Yeah, on like making your goals public and telling people about them makes you more likely to achieve them. Oh, I'm going to have to look that up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I'm excited now. I'll mark my calendar. Whenever ooh, you okay. Well, I'm so glad I announced it with you because you're the first one to hold me accountable for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to go, so I'm gonna make you plan it. Oh yeah. Oh my god. Okay, I'm I'm really excited. I'm like all giddy over here. <laughs> um. So I I'm, I really want to ask you about your integrative uh, approach to health because. I've been hearing about functional medicine recently. I don't know if that's the same. I don't know. Like, can you kind of debunk all that? Yeah. So there's like, there's a lot of different terms. I'm going to actually look up 
the definition of functional medicine right now to see if it's similar to integrative medicine. Yeah, I've been um, hearing so, it. Yeah, this one basically says like functional medicine is a medical treatment that focuses on optimal function of the body and, and uses holistic or alternative medicine. And that's like super similar to what integrative medicine is in the like allopathic or osteopathic like medical world. Um, I think integrative is the more common term or at least the more accepted term from this perspective right now. Mm -hmm. Um, I have been interested in it since I got into med school. Um, It's not really something we're taught in med school, but I have made an effort, especially fourth year when we have more flexibility in our schedule to find opportunities to learn more about it. So it's basically um, a type of medicine that looks at the whole person and um, uses obviously Western medicine and pharmacotherapy, but also integrates um, complementary treatment modalities that are still science based. And there's a lot of research in these areas, but um, incorporating more nutrition or acupuncture or um, Chinese medicine, all different kinds of um, complementary treatment modalities when appropriate, you can incorporate or um, use those things along with your Western medicine. Cool. Cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm all I'm all for that. Um, yeah, it's not always practical, you know. Like I'm on, I'm working on an inpatient psychiatry ward in the city right now, and like some of our patients come in, and me trying to like talk to them about their diet is like worthless, you know. Like that's, we're way past that at this point. There's such an acute presentation, but there is um, a huge time and a place for it. It's you just have to know when that is. Right. It, it's the timing. Um, yeah, it's the the situation. Um, I have a quick question. Are you a DO student? No, I'm an MD student. Oh, okay. Because I went to a school in, in Florida that they have DO, and I didn't know what that was until I went to this school. I just thought there was MD. I mean, is... is um, a lot um, of people don't know about DOs. Yeah. yeah. Um, so doctors of osteopathic medicine, they have the exact same practicing rights. You would call them doctor, and you probably maybe have been treated by one or seen one in a hospital and not even realize that the letters after their name say DO, not MD. Um it's much less common, but becoming way more common and more and more schools are opening. Um, and, and they, you know, in theory, they, they definitely have an entire curriculum on osteopathic manipulative medicine, which sort of is like chiropractic, but a little bit more that they learn about. Um, and in, in theory, they're a little bit more of a holistic model, but, um, from the ones I've talked to, in practice, it's pretty much identical. Um, I think it can be a little difficult to find a DO that, practices anything other than just sort of typical medicine. Um, But I think it's super cool that they have that whole other education background. And I totally support that um, theory and that method of it. So yeah, I work, you know, some of the doctors I'm working with right now are DOs. They're great. Oh, okay. I yeah, because I was wondering, you said integrative medicine, and I just like assumed DO. But then I'm like, I don't know, um, know, because a lot of people have assumed that I would go to DO school because of sort of their theory on medicine. But when I was looking at them, one, they weren't in like cities I wanted to be in because there are not as many of them. And when I talked to people and was like, you know, how much of an emphasis do you feel like there really is on this? Like, are people practicing this? I really, the, at least the people I talked to were like, eh, no, people really aren't like that super into it. Like, and so I just decided like to apply to regular and go to regular, but I'm sure I would have loved it if I went to those because I would have really loved learning all that stuff. <laughs> but it seems like you're like the direction you're taking is involving a lot of the the holistic approach the the integrative medicine. Yeah, so any type of medical residency is going to have western medicine like you have to learn the the pharmacology and the western medicine way of doing things and that was why I chose to go to medical school because I wanted to fully understand that and and understand the physiology and and the medications you can use but then also be able to use alternative things as well. So um, I think I'm definitely going to apply some residencies that have an integrative medicine curriculum weaved in, or um, now you can do an integrative medicine fellowship after your residency and do like an entire year where you learn um, all of that different stuff. So it's still not super common. Most doctors don't practice it, but I am really interested in it. So I'm trying to head in that direction. Yeah, I... I think that's fascinating, and I think that, um, like, do you see that becoming bigger in the next, like, five to ten years? I sure hope so. Right. Um, you know, I think a lot more people in my class are interested in it. I just did, like, a super 
um, quick poll on my class's Facebook page asking who would be inter- interested in an integrative medicine elective, and like almost 50% were. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, I think, you know, more and more patients are asking about it or just saying like, hey, I heard about acupuncture, like what do you know about it? And I think it's part of our responsibility to be able to give them good feedback. You know, whether it's, hey, this is what I know that works or actually the studies show that it doesn't really do anything, but go for it because it's, if it's placebo, then that's great, you know. Um, I want to be able to just sort of know about it and, you know, I, I love Western medicine. It's a miracle worker. It saves lives. But I also know that there's plenty of people in plenty of situations where maybe you can heal and provide treatment that doesn't require drugs um, if the patients are looking for that and willing to go that route. So um, just sort of as many options as I have and as many tools in my toolbox to help patients. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And, um, I recently, like last year I took a cruise with my husband and his family and I got like this massage and like this facial. And then they were really trying to push me to like, you know, of course, like that's where they make a lot of money in the spa. Uh So they're trying to push me to get acupuncture and like pay $400 for like these things, like this cream for my face. And then I realized, you know what? I would feel way more comfortable going to a doctor right i just didn't like trust like i mean they were probably great i did get the massage but i didn't get acupuncture because i'm like this is they're really jacking up the prices here on this group yeah, well, I mean, obviously you want to look at the education there's still some complementary treatments that like don't have good licensing boards i learned a lot about this on this retreat i went on i was talking to some different naturopathic doctors and he was saying it's super hard because certain states don't require any licensing so anyone can call them a naturopath and i'm not sure if that's the same for acupuncture but i think that anytime you're going to someone you may want to just like look at their credentials and make sure they know what they're doing Yeah, yeah, and that's what scared me because I didn't have Wi-Fi. I'm like, I can't look these people up. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. No, acupuncture in Chinese medicine school, in school is a full four years, damn. and like naturopathic school too. Like they, I, I know I was just learning about this. Like they learn a lot, and so um, you know, you wanna you wanna do the, pay them the respect of respecting their training and going to professional people and. Um, making sure that you're not going to get like harmed in any way by going to someone that hasn't had the proper amount of education. Right. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's so true. Um, yeah, I've been interested in that and I just like, I have to get this, I have to throw like put you on the spot, like just for a second, because Uh it's been on my mind since I was like a teenager. I've had severe, oh, not severe, but I've had moderate acne. Uh And every time I've gone to any dermatologist my whole life I've been told food does not affect my skin but I find that so hard to believe and maybe I'm like well you know acne is a medical condition and maybe like they don't I I just like I don't know like does can you is there any way you can answer that (laughs) like this I'm not a dermatologist and we only have about like a week of true um dermatology courses so I'm not to claim anything I and I and I haven't read the studies so like do not take my word for this at all I know that anecdotally a lot of people have found success um clearing up skin issues by cutting out certain foods like you know dairy and stuff like that um and I think that maybe what they were referring to is that acne is a bacteria like it's called acne vulgaris that actually causes acne and it gets into those like sort of clogged ducts and causes the the acne and the pimples and so in that sense she might say it's not related to your food because it's a bacteria um but i'm sure there's tons of studies that i could go look up and and i know people have had success with their skin by changing their diet so um i think that that's probably something we could look into and figure it out and like i said there might be a different dermatologist that's into more integrative stuff that would totally recommend something different to you um but i will always say you know trust your doctor I'm not a doctor. I can't give medical advice on here. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's just something that's always uh, plagued me. And I, I've had wonderful success with complete Western medicine, but and at the same time have also hit many roadblocks with, with that my journey with my skin. So it's, yeah, I'm, I, I would like to find an integrative um, dermatologist or... Um, good thing to look for. Yeah. Um someone that has been looking into the research in different areas and can provide some maybe different suggestions you could try. And if nothing else, like cutting out dairy isn't going to hurt you. So it's yeah. worth a shot, you know? Yeah, I have cut out cow's milk. Um, I still eat cheese, but but I did, I have noticed cool. my skin has 
um, I, I substituted it with almond almond milk uh, in my smoothies, and I, I love it. I love the taste, so it's yeah. been a great substitution for me. <laughs> right, like, and, you know, like I said, you know, we're in charge of our own health, and as long as you're not doing anything that's going to harm you, like, you can experiment and figure out what works best for you, but a doctor is only going to tell you something that's probably pretty science-backed, and if there isn't, like, hard and fast research proving it, then they probably aren't going to, like, recommend it to you. Um, right yeah that's where you get stuck like I've in the past before I fully understand stood like medicine and scientific research I would say like but this worked and they're like I get that it worked for one person but if the data doesn't explicitly show it then I can't tell my patients that it works <laughs> so it, yeah yeah exactly and it's it's tricky I, I feel as an occupational therapist we the the evidence-based uh treatments and um it's true it doesn't what my work for one person doesn't work for everyone else so yeah we have to take that with a grain of salt um so like where can someone find an integrative um doctor or like is do they have extra cred um credentials or so that's a good question so I'm wondering if there's a website that lists everyone that goes has gone through the integrative medicine um fellowship um i would like google in your area like integrative physician or something and um there might be a list of people that practice medicine and you just want to make sure that like they also have like a real medical degree too (laughs) um you know because there's a lot of language that isn't regulated and so a lot of people can call them different things um but I want to, I would bet that there's like a database. Oh, look, if you go to integrativemedicine.arizona.edu, there is a thing that says, find an integrative health and medicine professional. And it, it's a directory of graduates from their fellowship. And you can choose a city and a state. Um, so that was like one of the first things that mm. came up when I Googled um, integrative medicine fellowship or integrative medicine doctor. The Arizona Institute is sort of the leader, Dr. Andrew Weil, came up with a lot of the curriculum for integrative medicine throughout the country. And I actually just got accepted to a rotation there later this year, which I'm super excited about. Congrats. Thank you. Yeah. It's like, so um, Dr. Andrew Weil is phenomenal and sort of like paved the way with integrative medicine. So um, a lot of the different programs that incorporate integrative medicine use the Arizona model. So that is always a good place to go and trust and look for stuff. That's awesome. I'm also going to link that in the show notes. Cool. Yeah, I mean, this has been really helpful because um, I know in I'm really like I listen to a lot of the the wellness uh, podcasts and I'm I feel like I'm I try to stay on top of what's going on and there's so much you know buzz around Eastern um, medicine and I I feel like this is a really great middle ground like yeah. so, so to speak because it's. It's like exactly what you said, having many tools in your toolkit to find the best solution. Um, and I think that this is a great uh, resource. I'm sure people are, are, the audience is happy to learn about. Yeah. And I think that some people, when they hear like complementary medicine, they assume that it's all just like hippy dippy stuff with no research, but there's a ton of scientific research going on in these areas. And like, we still believe in, in research and proving it's true and we're not going to do anything harmful or, you mm-hmm. know, so it's, you're getting sort of the best of both worlds and and, um, making sure that we're still doing the best accurate thing for the patient, not just sort of forget for going science. We would never do that. (laughs) Right, right. And I've read so much, so many studies on on mindfulness um, Mm -hmm. and how that affects physical health. And I'm just like, like taken, like taken aback by that. It's so interesting. Mindfulness is where it's at. All the studies on meditation and yoga these days, Um, it's super cool. I'm fascinated by mental health and, um, getting back into a good meditation habit right now and the different, it's, it makes like our society is just so bad about it with, and I am too, like I'm terrible with constantly being on my phone and hyper stimulated and never slowing down. I think there's some sort of study I heard about that says that like most people are only actually present 50% of the time, Wow. like what they're doing, you know, and, and it's hard yeah, there's just so much good data on how when we're constantly all over the place, things don't go well. (laughs) And yeah, there's so, you know, mental health and physical health are so related. And there's just more and more research going on in that area. Um, I just read an article earlier today, and it was um, 
it wasn't like a, in a randomized controlled study. It was just an observational study, but they were finding links between stress and autoimmune conditions. Um, so yeah, there's like so much more to learn about that. Um, so super excited to see where all of that research goes. Oh, yes. I've read so much, uh, like so many uh, articles and I have this huge stress and health book and it's like it's astounding to see how our and it's true, like we are constantly overstimulated. I mean, that's another talk for like another time, like a a digital detox. It's like like we all need one. (laughs) It's hard because there's so many good things about the Internet and so many good things you can do with the social media. But I definitely think social media is. I say this like as a blogger and someone that does, <laughs> but um, I think it's been caused a lot of problems as well, for sure. Like, and I am so grateful that I didn't have to go through high school with like Instagram. And Facebook and I am so thankful for that too. I just had AIM. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know AIM was like the best we had. And it was great. You, it took you like 10 minutes to just log on the internet. <laughs> Everyone had like their silly little email address and you like, <laughs> oh my goodness, I know. And yeah. we'll like call our our landlines and ask permission to talk to somebody on the phone. Oh yeah, those, oh, those were the days. Doesn't make you feel old. I mean, so much has so much has changed. If I think so much has changed from like our parents' time to now, I mean, excuse me, from our time, like our teen time to now, like imagine our parents, like they have really seen change. Oh my God. <laughs> Another thing, I'm like, I cannot believe my parents went to med school without Google. Like, like I don't know how they ha- possibly had time to learn it all. Like I don't have enough time to learn it all, and I can Google it and find out the answers in a split second. They had to like use books in libraries, mm-hmm. like. Oh my goodness. And I realized like there wasn't as much medicine to learn back then. Like genetics didn't even exist, but oh my goodness. I oh. like just can't imagine what it was like. Both of your parents uh, went to med school? Yeah, they met in med school. Oh my God, that's so cute. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I met my husband in, in grad school. He's a PT and I'm an OT. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Our, um, our class is like starting to pair off and there's lots of engagements going on right now. So... Oh, yeah, it's lots of weddings. <laughs> yep, there will be lots of weddings coming up. Thank you so much for being on this on this podcast, Claire. Like, we had so much to talk about, and um, you, like, I, our audience, I'm sure, like, learned so much from this episode. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so I, I would love to end with this, my signature question. What is your most lit up self? Ooh, that's a good question. Like, what do I, what am I doing? Or, like, what am I like? Yeah. Um, so I just sort of wrote about this. I was at an integrative medicine retreat like two weeks ago, um, in California and it was just like the most blissful week. I was not stressed. I was learning things that I'm passionate about. I was having meaningful conversations. I was sleeping enough and I was just like brighter and happier and laughing and like people told me and I, I feel like I don't want to like sound conceited to say this, but people at the end of the week were like, you're so bright and funny and fun to be around. And I realized like, man, people haven't told me that in a long time because I've been so bogged down and stressed with school. But like, that is my most lit lit up self when I'm like doing something I'm super passionate about and around amazing people. And I'm just like, oh, I'm like getting lit up just talking about it. (laughs) Oh, Oh, that's awesome. I love that. Oh my God. I love that. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks so much for listening. Like what you're hearing? Subscribe to our podcast, rate, and write a review on iTunes. It would mean the world to us. We come out with new and exciting content each week that will help you slay your burnout beast. So share the show with your friends and your coworkers so we can build a better healthcare industry together. Thanks again.